arms and armour. Um, and rather than just bombard you with lots of beautiful, lovely images of Sikh weapons, we're going to hope today to do something a little bit more. Um, we're going to make an attempt, if we can, to just dig a little bit deeper and as, lo as well as understanding Sikh arms and armour and understanding how we are uh, going to be able to identify it, we also want to make an effort to try to understand those who wielded these weapons and try to get an insight into the psychology and psyche of these warriors that held such arms. Before we, before we begin, we're just going to do a quick recap over certain historical events just to set the scene, to understand um, these objects of our material heritage is often is, is paramount for us to, first of all, to try and go back in time, to change our vantage point and to understand things from the perspective of those that we're researching. Just a quick recap to history, just to try to get an insight into the early military tradition of the Sikhs and how it developed and for what reason. So the Sikh religion begins in the 15th century with Guru Nanak, the first of ten Gurus, born at uh, a very pivotal, pivotal time in the history of India, a time when the Mughals under the Emperor Barbara are just pretty much setting up a shop. We're going to skip here. Sorry, sorry. The next image here is an image of the fifth Guru, Gurajan. Now, Gurajan, we most, he's most famous for being the first martyr, first in a long line of Sikh martyrs in history, uh, executed by the Emperor Jahangir, who uh, described in his memoirs as Gurajan's shop becoming far too popular, and basically saying that he had to close down the shop of Gurajan, which was the way that he put uh, his execution. What we, what we don't often consider, however, is prior to this, there already had been an early uh, effort to initially militarise the Sikhs under Gurangrit, who set up the Malakara Kudur Sahib, so wrestling, introducing the Sikhs to wrestling uh, and such things. After the execution of Guru Arjun, the history of the Sikhs was about to take a very crucial turn. His successor and follower, Guru Hargobind, was the first to formalise the Sikhs into a military unit. Under the guidance of Baba Buddha here, seen on the right, he received his military training. He's most famous for uh, ascending the spiritual throne, wearing the two swords of Miri and Biri, instructing his Sikhs not just to consider uh, their, the spiritual journey, but also to consider their place on earth, their temporal existence. Sorry. Basically, he was instructing his Sikhs that they had to secure their political and social free freedom in order to secure their spiritual freedom. We then skip to the ninth Guru, Rukdeg Wahadir, the last of the Sikh Guru Martyrs, who is considered as gave the supreme sacrifice, seeing as he gave his life for another's faith. He, another's faith. he was executed by the Emperor Jahangir, and here on the right we see an early and rare image of Guru Gobind Singh, the 10th Guru of the Sikhs, who received the head of his father at the age of nine and became the spiritual leader of the Sikhs. Guru Gobind Singh, in his younger years, received such training in the arts of uh, training in such arts like horsemanship, swordsmanship, archery, as well as things like Raghavidya and uh, learning the Veds and learning Sanskrit and Persian. He grew up to be a formidable warrior. And here we see him on the left. Sadly, he came, he came into conflict here with the Emperor Aurangzeb, who is the, not only executed his father, but also responsible for the death of his four sons. Sadly, the Guru, Guru was not able to lead the Sikhs uh, a kingdom of their own. But what he did do was help to pave the way for, their future, uh, for the future military machine that was to be. The 1700s saw quite a difficult time in the history of the Sikhs. The Guru had fled down south and where he died in the Deccan 
and the Sikhs escaped to the hills, the Himalayan hills. And over the 17th century, it's quite a crucial time because slowly, slowly, the, the slowly, sorry, the Mughal Empire was weakening due to the threat of the British, the Persians, the Murtas, the Afghans, and North India was left without without rule really. And the Sikhs were very quick to to fill this vacuum, and soon they emerged once again, claiming the land of Punjab. The missiles organised themselves into into twelve various groups, and it's interesting to note here that. They were very good at coming together when there was an external threat, but when there was no one else to fight, they were often bickering and fighting amongst themselves for land. The con consolidation of the missiles came under Ranjit Singh, who helped to bring everybody together and was uh, crowned the Maharaja of Punjab. Sadly, after the death of Ranjit Singh, he hadn't really left a suitable heir. And the next decade or so saw uh, a difficult time in Punjab, culminating in the annexation by the British in 1849. And here we have an image of Maharaja Shir Singh, his son, one of the successors, who was assassinated within the next 10 years, which were filled with uh, intrigue. The last Maharaja of the Sikhs, uh, a sad figure in Sikh history really, Maharaja Dalip Singh, here shown in an early photograph, was exiled to Britain. He was converted to Christianity, forced to hand over his crown, his kingdom, as well as things such as the uh, Kohinoor diamond. And this was virtually, this was pretty much the end of the, the Sikh period, which only really, the Sikh kingdom, which only really lasted well, approximately 50 years. Now I'm going to open this up at this stage. We're here to discuss Sikh weapons, and I want to pose a question to you guys. I want to ask the question, what exactly is, or can someone actually name me, a Sikh weapon? Don't be shy. Kirpan, someone says. Someone says, Kirpan, small Kirpan, big Kirpan, big Lakh Talwar. Tigga. 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 Tigga, but someone who obviously knows too much. <laughs> and some, I heard something at the back. Khanda, we hear over here. Anything else there at the back? Neza. Sorry? Neza. 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 Okay. Yeah, Neza. Okay. At, the, at the moment, I'm going to disagree with all of you. And I'm going to say that none of them are Sikh weapons. I hope you're comfortable with that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to this in a moment. But at the moment, no. I don't think any of them are. Now, before we look at Sikh weapons, before we look at some images of some Sikh weapons, why is a sword as a symbol or weapons in Sikhism so important? At first the Lord created a double-edged sword and then he created the whole world. This is from the writings of Guru Gobind Singh and Dasam Gam. This is the importance that Guru Gobind Singh puts on the sword. The sword in Sikhism is seen as a symbol of God's power on earth. It's seen as a symbol of justice, as the fight against tyranny. It's seen as the deliverer. Here at the bottom here we have an image of the Kandar Guru Gobind Singh which is preserved at Anandpur Sahib which supposedly was used in 1699 on the day that he administered Amrit to the Panjabiyari. And we have images such as this. Images that we probably kind of, as, as Sikhs here, probably kind of got used to and now often don't think about the impact of such images. Ima imagine an image such as this in a church for example. You go in and you're going to do Mattaj to the Guru Granth Sahib here, but before that, you're seeing all of this. You're seeing all of these weapons in front of the Guru. This is uh, quite a sight, really, if you think about it. I mean, this is, if you consider the importance here that's put on these weapons. After Guru Gobind Singh gave the Guruship to the Guru Granth Sahib, it was considered amongst Sikhs as if, as the, as the, script, the scripture itself was considered the, the Atma of the Guru, the Khalsa was considered the body of the Guru and the weapons, the Guru's life force. Images such as these are scattered all over Punjab in temples and in homes and dere, uh, and they remind us of, of the warriors that once were, the Shaheeds of the past. 
Under Ranjit Singh, which is mainly the, the area that we're going to be looking at, sadly we don't have an awful lot of information regarding the weapons that were around at the times of the Gurus. Not much has been documented about their armories, uh, the armories that were set up then, all the weapons that were preserved from that time. So mainly we're going to be looking at the, the era of Ranjit Singh. Now Ranjit Singh, we know, set up various armories in Amritsar, Sialgod, in Lahore, uh, Multan, various places. And here's an image here of a Sikh, Sikhli guy or an armourer. Uh, in front of his armoury here you see some swords and some nedges and spears and some shields, etc. An image of the court of Ranjit Singh. Ranjit Singh ran, a secu had a secular state with uh, ministers from various communities as well as Sikh communities. He had Hindus and Muslim ministers. And it was a very, very colourful court. The Sikhs at this time were, were rich they, 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 and they were keen to shut it off. We have a quote here from Emily Eden, who was uh, the sister of uh, the Governor General at the time, who visited Ranjit Singh's camp in 1837. And when she visited the camp, she described the scene as such. She said, I think the entrance to the camp this morning was the finest thing I saw anywhere. There were altogether four miles of Ranjit soldiers drawn up in lines. A great number are dressed in orange turbans, tunics and trousers, made of gold and silver, cloth of every possible shade of colour. They have long black and white beards, and a large expenditure of shawls and scarves are disposed in drapery about them. Their matchlocks are inlaid with gold or steel or silver, some of them with bows and arrows, some with long spears, and all the chief ones with black heron's plumes. Everything about them is showing, showy and glittering. Their horses with their gold and silver hangings, their powder flasks embroidered in gold. An image here of Hari Singh Nambla, a famous general of Ranjit Singh, with his, with his Sikhs. Let's begin to examine some Sikh weapons. We have a Dalwar hill here. Dalwar, typical Punjabi hill. After a while, you begin to pick up from the shape of the sword hill, from which region of India it's from. The decoration is also very important in helping us identify not only when it was produced, but where it was produced. The type, the way in which the gold was overlaid, uh, the inscriptions that were used at the time. If we have a look here inside the knuckle bow, it gives us the name of the owner in Gurmukhi. And with a little further research, we can identify the owner as Sham Singhadari, a Sikh uh, who actually came out of retirement and died at the Battle of Sabrawan fighting the British. <clears throat> Slightly wider blade here, one that we'd probably call a dig of a different type of steel. And this one, once again, typical Punjabi hilt. The pommel of the sword here with a Suraj Mukhi or a sunburst design. We'll come, into, we'll come back to this later on to, to consider why they would use such uh, decoration. And once again, inside the knuckle bow, we have an inscription, Gaal Zahai, with the name of Fatih Singh. And with a little bit of research, we find out the sword actually belonged to Fatih Singh Aluwalia, a contemporary of Ranjit Singh, uh, a pivotal figure in Sikh history, very instrumental in the early days of Ranjit Singh, helping him to form the foundations of his kingdom. Another Dalwar here. The hill, once again, we begin to become more and more familiar with the type, the form of the Sikh, of the of Punjabi hilt, and the type of uh, gold overlay. The inscription inside the knuckle bow this time identifies the owner as Miha Singh. And Miha Singh was a governor of Kashmir at the time of Ranjit Singh. Now, all these inscriptions here that we've shown have had written, the words written Agal Sahai and then the name of the owner. And this was quite a common motto at the time. We see it not only on swords, but on flags and on cannon and guns, etc. Agal meaning the, the timeless one and Sahai to protect. So Agal Sahai made the timeless one, I God protect, and then the name of the owner. This is a sword of Ranjit Singh that some of you may have seen in the Wallace Collection in London. Uh, a very, very, very fine sword indeed, uh, with a Persian blade. Uh, and it's important to note here that not, the Sikhs were not only making their own weapons, but weapons and blades particularly were being imported and exported all the time. Henry Fane, who visited Ranjit Singh in 1837, actually was able to go, get into Ranjit Singh's Toshakan, actually into his treasury, and he remarked, he said, the swords were many of them of great value, the blades alone being in some instances valued at a thousand pounds, and the gold and silver jewels upon their hilts, 
and scabbards at five times that sum. Now he's talking about a thousand pounds back in 1837. Now I don't know exactly how much money that would be today, but it's an awful lot of money. Uh, so they, they really were spending on their blades and uh, it would be far, far more expensive than that blade would probably cost today. This is an interesting sword which recently came up in, in an auction in, uh, in London. And this sword had an inscription on it which said that it, would, it was sold by a Sikh chief to uh, an English officer and the Sikh chief had told this officer that it had been in, in his family for 250 years. And the blade on this sword was actually a 17th century Persian blade. So it just goes to show how much these weapons were prized by the Sikhs. They were handed down from father to son for generations. We have some katars here, some punch daggers. These are preserved at Gila Mubarak in Patiala. And once again, you begin to develop an eye after a while. After a while, of the type of gold decoration that was applied. Copious amounts of gold overlaid. I won't get too technical here, but generally it's thought that this, the 17th century was pretty much the zenith in terms of the arts in India, as well as the arms production. So the paintings and the arms of the 17th century is pretty much when things hit the peak. And there are two types of gold decoration. One is to inlay the gold in the steel, and one is to just arrest it on the surface, overlay. Sadly, because of the time of seeking in the 19th century, the main, main technique that was used at the time was overlay. So to find pieces that are actually inlaid with gold is, is actually quite, is very, very rare. And this guitar here on the side, on the sidebars here, it has Gurumukhi script. Not easily decipherable now, but telling us and giving us the information that it, that it was a Sikh Qadar. These weapons, originally Qadars themselves, are traced back to the 14th century, these types of punch daggers, uh, and traced back to the Hindu kingdoms. The Mughals adopted these weapons, and were very fond of these weapons, and the Sikhs adopted them too. Sikhs in armour. There's two paintings here showing Sikh cavalrymen from the uh, this images from the Victorian Albert Museum. The Sikhs and Sikhs did wear armour, and here we have the proof. Here we have uh, a Sikh with chainmail shirt and uh, and quiver and bows, and both interestingly wear, here are wearing helmets. Uh, a nice feature here that they they seem to have small buggery, small small bugs there tied over the top of the helmets to secure them. Their helmets adorned with herons plumes. This guy here on the right having a slightly different type of armour. He's wearing uh, what we would call a jarena, or uh, literally translates to four mirrors. You'd have a plate at the front for the chest, one for the back, and two for the sides. And this comes from, uh, the words come from Persian. So per Persian armour that then comes to India, and the Indian is influenced by it, and here we have a Sikh shown wearing it. This actually is a suit of armour here from the Royal Armouries. This was uh, taken from Ranjit Singh's Dosha Khanna after annexation. And here we can actually see. So you've got the, the, the buzzubans or the gauntlets overlaid with lots and lots of gold. The mitts here, probably inlaid with silver and gold wire. A, um, a chainmail shirt made up of steel and brass links. And here, slightly stylized, but an image here of Hari Singh Nalwa, the general that we saw earlier on, in a full suit of armour here. Not 100% accurate in its depiction, but we can see that he's got chainmail, arm guards, a helmet here. Once again, he's, you can see a buggery there over the, top of the, over the top of the helmet there, securing it. This is quite interesting. So we had Emily Eden earlier just trying to describe the seat court to us, and they, it seems like a very, very colourful place, and it looked like a very, very colourful place. This is in, um, an example of the uh, jacket of Nona Harsing, who was Ranjit Singh's grandson. And this is at the Victorian Albert Museum. And to look at it, it just looks like an ordinary silk coat. So it's, it's made up of red and green silks, uh, very intricately woven here with gold and silver thread. But actually, it's more than just a coat. Because if you actually lift the jacket, you can actually see it's actually lined with chainmail. So this guy would have been wearing armour in court and you wouldn't have known it. And my personal favourite, some chainmail pajami. Uh, that belonged to, I think these belong to Karak Singh actually, so the father of uh, uh, Norna Hal Singh. Quite difficult to sleep in, I imagine. I could show you lots and lots of images, and I'll try to pick out what I think are some of the most interesting ones. But, and this here is, 
it's been a contentious issue in the past, but there's, it's not really a contentious issue. The Sikhs did wear helmets. And this is probably, up until now, probably the finest example that we've found. And it's actually in the Louvre in Paris, where, where the Mona Lisa is, if, every, if any, any of you ever fancy going there. Uh, the image is not that great, but we've taken some better photos next time I went. Sadly, when I went back, they actually turned it around, so I couldn't photograph the front of it. But we've got the space here for the jeweler. And uh, this is actually a very rare feature. Normally you find these chainmail, uh, these helmets with chainmail, like this one at the front that you can see afterwards. And this one actually um, uh, has, has actually taken influence from the Deccan, I believe, with these big ear flaps and these back plates. I just wanted to draw your attention to this picture here, because this is it's a good way to actually examine these helmets. But this is an image of Desha Singh Manjitia, uh, 19th century image, and Sikhs, we, there's, there's probably about 20 different type, types of the style of bug here in this room. Um, and they had they tie, they tie their terms in slightly different ways. And if we draw a comparison here to that helmet, we can see that they had an interesting way of covering the jura here at the front. And this helmet at the front has actually got a cutaway open slot. I'm not sure what the purpose of this slot would have been, but it seems very likely that here they're just trying to depict the star as well as they can, even to the, if you can look at the extent of the detail of the gold, we're actually trying to basically mimic the, the layers of the bug itself. There are a few of these helmets in existence, uh, and here's a couple of other variations. In the, these are from uh, a museum in, uh, in Punjab, in Pagala. And this one's an interesting one because we don't often see these turban helmets for the space of the with plumes. Seek shields. One of the finest ones that we know of, this is actually preserved in Birmingham and uh, probably dating from about 1830 and maybe, maybe a bit later actually, um, depicting famous chiefs from the Sikh court made of Damascus steel. Damascus steel is a, a very important steel that now they don't fully have the technique of how to reproduce this steel but back then it was considered that it was worth its weight in gold. Firearms, Sikhs were very very fond of firearms and very famous for being good shots off of horseback and here is an image of uh, Ranjit Singh's bodyguards. And let's have a look at a matchlock gun <clears throat> from the time. This is actually here at the front, so you can actually have a look at this later on. The side here of the gun overlaid with thick, heavy silver. The muzzle of the gun uh, in the shape of a mythical sea monster of Makara. And the gold here, this is where we can draw clues sometimes of either who it was made for or who it was made by. The gold here is uh, done in, in paisley pattern, so it could either uh, signify a patron from Kashmir or an artist from Kashmir. And once again, this an inscription that reveals to us that this is a Sikh gun, because th this style of gun is uh, seen all over India. It slightly differs in the Punjab, but Syria guards are high in Gurmukhi. There's no name of the owner, sadly, on this one. Smaller firearms, uh, a painting of Lena Singh Sandanwalia, and we can these images. It's it's good when we actually find the objects from the time because it helps us to consider how accurate some of these images are. And here we have him with the Dalar and a blunderbuss pistol, a blunderbuss gun. And this is a blunderbuss gun, or a damacha as we would call it, um, that actually belonged to Maharaja Gulab Singh Dogra, um, and this is. Sorry, I think I'm getting pretty close to my skin. This is um, preserved at the V&A, and we can see it very elaborately chased here and gilded, and the barrel here of Damascus steel once again. Artillery. Ranjit Singh was very fond of Sikh cannon, and uh, it's said that whenever he actually conquered a new region, one of the first things that he would do was uh, to, to send back the cannon. Send back the cannon first, and then he would take care of business thereafter. Is an interesting story when Lord Bentinck, uh, an English officer, in about 1836, I believe, visited Ranjit Singh's court. And at this time, it's interesting to note that the Sikh kingdom, Punjab, is one of the last 
is one of the last kingdoms to be annexed, taken by the British. And at the death of Ranjit Singh, it's said that the Sikhs actually were basically in equal number to the British. So the British arms and the Sikh and the Sikh might would have been equal to so both parties. The Sikhs and the British both would have been keen to avoid a fight. So up until then, you have uh, the Sikhs and the British with a very interesting relationship, gifting things to one another, visiting one another often. And uh, Lord Benting, in 1836, actually gifted a cannon to Ranjit Singh. And Ranjit Singh asked him to demonstrate how it worked, and he did. And he notes that two, two years later, when he came back to Punjab, he actually found himself facing 70 more of these cannons. Ranjit Singh was very quick to have these cannons copied. And he copied them with the help of people such as Lena Singh Ranjitya here, who was uh, a Sikh at the time of Ranjit Singh, who was uh, very skilled in, in science and maths and language. And Lena Singh Ranjitya, along with a Frenchman, General Court, actually copied that cannon and, was, uh, and reproduced it. And the British were later to regret gif gifting such things. <laughs> Gali Singh here, a very good image of uh, Gali Singh. Uh, just, just that of the brother at the time of uh, Ranjit Singh. And here we can see he, he's, he's carrying pretty much all the weapons that he could possibly carry. Um, he's got a bow here with a quiver, a matchlock gun, the loire, uh, looks like a, a, a dagger here, a kadar, all sorts of things. And particularly I want to draw your attention to his, the star, or type of style of the star, the star of Bunga, or uh, the, the fortress, as we would uh, describe it. And here's actually a real one that she's preserved at the Victorian Albert Museum. Now, this, his small desire, probably very, very practical the style. And not only was it uh, a house for all these weapons, so for him to uh, keep all these weapons, all these projectile weapons that he'd be using, but also for, for anybody who's done any martial arts here, you'd know that if, if you need to get, get control over somebody's body, it's often very important, it's very important to get control over their head. So this would have acted as a deterrent in hand-to-hand -hand combat for anybody who wanted to get control of his head. So he's got all sorts of chakka and, and, and little guns. Dhirmukhi here near the star. What we said earlier about Sikh weapons and me disagreeing. Now, I don't totally disagree, but I, I, it really just depends on your definition. And what I want you to consider is are we describing these Sikh weapons or calling these Sikh weapons because they were invented or designed by Sikhs? Is that why they're Sikh weapons? Was it made by a Sikh? Was it commissioned by a Sikh? Or just worn and adopted by a Sikh? I want to draw your attention to this picture, a very important picture. This was depicting an event from approximately 1570, but the painting's from about 1580, and it's, it shows Emperor Akbar witnessing a battle between two rival groups of sadhus at a, a religious mela. These groups of sadhus were actually fighting for the best spot, and he, he witnesses this battle. If we have a look in detail, we can actually see some of the weapons that they're using. And here we have a talwar, sadly, wedged into this guy's head. <laughs> uh, a kanda. There's a chap here who's carrying a, a gurj or a salutta. And even here we've got lots and lots of chakra that are whizzing around, whizzing around the battlefield. Now the reason why this is interesting is that this is an image showing the use of these weapons before the Sikhs actually became a military power. So Guru Arjun actually dies in 1606. So this is before Guru Arjun, the, uh, Guru Hargobind has formalized the Sikhs into a military unit. And these are often these are often weapons that, I think some of we, we said these weapons, you know, Chakkar especially, Kande, Balwaras, these weapons were well in use before, but were used, in use well before the Sikhs became uh, a military power. That's not to say that there aren't any Sikh weapons. We've got a very funny image here of uh, two Akalis, and if we have a look at their Chakkar, which uh, are a little bit distinctive, we can see they've got these sharp knives here attached. And here's actually one which is from the British Museum. So as, as a lot of Chakka we know existed prior to the Sikhs, but they were very happy to adopt and modify and, and bring these weapons on board and make them their own. 
engraving here of Bud Singh Gali, native of Lahore, 1846. I want to draw your attention to here, the star, particularly here. And we have here a, a nakka, a barg nakka. Barg is uh, a panther or uh, a leopard, uh, a nakka claw. And if we have a look, here we have two different types of barg nakka or tiger claws. And this is the general type that we would see. So this is actually one that you could hold. And it was used uh, in warfare as well as in the courts of the Maharajas for wrestling bouts, etc. However, we have one here which once again has been modified. And this is a Sikh Bhagnaka, and this is one that you couldn't hold. This is only made to be put into a Dastar like this. So weapons such as these, when we find them, we know are individually Sikh. What I want to do next is, we've had a look at a few weapons, and uh, I want for us to examine not only the decoration of the weapons in terms of the, the pattern, etc., but also the iconography attached to these weapons, uh, to consider... Uh, what insight that iconography, the decoration, can give us into the warriors who actually had these weapons. The reason why I've used this quote here is, is this will require us, some of us at least, to just remove our blinkers and, and look and in-depth particularly at, at certain things that we would normally dismiss. Now, Guru Gobind Singh said at the beginning, he, his mission... The mission for which he, he says he was born was to uphold Dharam. And he, he says that he wants to train his sparrows to hunt the royal hawks and he would teach one man to be able to fight a legion. There, there are various uh, skills uh, that these warriors would have to, learn, have to have learned. And um, for example, things like uh, Raghavadya, for example, uh, we, we know the tradition in the in the um, sort of Ard Guru Granth, where we have Raghavadya to describe uh, and to basically uh, help us feel particular moods and give us, help us give Shanti, help us to understand the Guru's message. But these kind of rags, etc., also exist in Dasam Granth uh, to give you the opposite. So, not to give you Shanti, but for mainly for, for, for warriors to listen to and to prepare them for battle. And at this point, I just want to pay, play for you a soundtrack. Uh, uh, of, a, of a Nagara that would just just to reiterate the point that these, these guys would be listening to various such things basically to help prepare them for battle. in the Dasangat, Guru Gobind Singh was very, very keen to translate various Hindu epics uh, for his warriors, describing the eternal struggle between good and evil. And this is a painting from the Punjab hill, hills which depicts some of the writings that, uh, of Guru Gobind Singh. And here we have avatars in this picture. This is a side of good here in the form of the Devte and you have the army of the Rakesh, the, 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 who uh, seems to be evil here. And there's various characters here which are depicted in Gurbani. So we have Narsingh Avtar, we have Chandi here on her tiger, Gali or Galka, who is the, the, the darker personification of Chandi, uh, Varhar Avtar here, Kartikeya here, the son of uh, Durga and Shiva. And it's some of this imagery that we see appearing in Sikh arms and armors. Imagery that we would 
normally associate with the Hindu tradition, but we actually find it on Sikh weapons very, very often. We saw this image earlier of Maharaja Sher Singh. Uh, I'm not sure how many of us would have spotted the Nishan Sahib here being carried by this, by this Singh on this horse here. And if you have a look in detail, we have an image of Kartikeya. Kartikeya, who is the son of Shiva. Shiva in the Hindu trinity is the, the, the destroyer. He's uh, the governor of time, Mahakal, and the son of Shiva and Durga here, Kartikeya, who is considered as the, the, uh, the general of the army of Devte. And here we have an image quite clearly of a, of a Singh happy to carry this flag here to, into battle. We saw this image before of uh, Hari Singh Nanua, and if we have a look at the flag here that they've been, uh, the, Sikh, the Sikhs here are carrying at the front, we see Galika, Gali, the darker personification we said, of, of Devi, of Jandi. And uh, there's even writing, writing of Bhai Gurdas II that actually describe, uh, he says that the, the sword of Guru Gobind Singh is Galka. The Gal, Galka is his sword. This helmet we saw earlier on, if we actually have a look at the, the Juraris helmet, it's clearly a Sikh helmet with an image of Durga on the helmet here. This probably makes some of you wonder. This is a, a set of uh, Sikh armor that was on display in Washington. And we don't have an image of the back, but once again on the back of this helmet there's, a, there's an image of, of Devi, or an image of Chandi on the back of this helmet. Now, some of you are probably asking, why? why? Why does this Hindu iconography come in? And we know that Sikhs uh, are not believers in idol worship. But what we have to bear in mind here is that the, the political climate at times, who is the guru recruiting to become Sikhs? Who is the guru recruiting from? Which, who is, what is his recruiting ground? Who are these guys that are becoming Sikhs uh, and, and fighting in this, in this struggle against, at that time, the Mughal army? We have these Sikh battle standards here that were captured after the Anglo-Sikh wars, and on one side we have a sunburst, and on the other side we have Devi Jandi here on, with, on her tiger here with Hanuman here leading her. An image of Karak Singh, Lahore 1857, if we have a look at his shield, and once again we see this sunburst. We've seen it on the flag, we've seen it on the shield, and earlier on we saw it on the pommel of the sword. Now the sunburst is a symbol Guru Gobind Singh discusses this, and in Hindu tradition, the Suraj dynasty, or Suraj Bansi, is the dynasty from which Ram, the Avtar Ram came from. Ram is the, the embodiment of the Kshatriya warrior. And Guru Gobind Singh says in Dasan Granth, he says that he is the son of Kshatriya, and he is not the son of a Brahman, and he himself traces his lineage back to Ram, and therefore to the Sun dynasty. And here we have images such as this to, to show the importance of this for the, for the warriors of the time. This cannon earlier on we saw from the Royal Artillery Museum. It's a captured seat gun after uh, post annexation. But in detail here we have an image of Hanuman actually inlaid in brass on the cannon. Various traditions. Sikhs were borrowing, borrowing, borrowing traditions from various cultures, not just the, the, the Hindu culture but also the Islamic culture. Here is a 16th century manuscript, Babur Nama, which shows Babur paying homage to his battle standards, to his islands here. <coughs> this is an image of Guru Gobind Singh's battle standard from, from Hazur Sahib. And here we have an image of a Sikh who himself has become the battle standard. He's wearing this gajga, not, not necessarily a practical term, but he's, he'll be happy to remain, remain conspicuous and he's here saying basically that the, if you ever look here, the battle standard is so important uh, you know, in battle, if, if your battle standard is to be lost, you'd forever be looking around for your battle standard. If your battle standard was lost, you'd know that your side had, had, uh, had been defeated. Each Sikh here would have become the battle standard. Quite an important image here, apart from showing us four very happy people who are quite <laughs> glad to be photographed. If we have a look in detail here, this guy's the star. We can pick out this image, an image of the modern day Kanda that we were all too familiar with. Now what's interesting about this image is that this shows us the earliest time that we actually see this Kanda, 1903. 
we have to ask ourselves that this is a an Im this is a symbol that we've adopted, and we see on our nishan sabs, uh, cars, bags, all sorts of places, and it's become synonymous with the Sikh faith. However, we can only trace it back to 1903. Until one of us here finds an image of it earlier, this this isn't probably a symbol that was being used before that. So what symbols were you being used before that? What symbols were being used by the Sikhs a few hundred years ago? Even such as, uh, symbols such as this. We're also familiar with this, the Adjad. I'm not sure how many of us actually questioned its origin or uh, existence. So, for, for example, here we clearly have a Kanda here, symbol in the middle, but, but, but what is this? This is, this is not the two Kurbans that we see in the Kanda, it's actually a crescent moon. This symbol turns up in in the Hindu culture, far earlier, and here we have a Vaishnavite ascetic, a sadhu, with the symbol on his forehead. Even earlier still, in the Chola period, 13th century India, the symbol exists. And in the Hindu culture, it's actually a symbol of the balance of the cosmos. So you have Shiva here de depicted uh, by the, the lingam, the male energy, and the balance here is the female energy in the form of his wife, Durga, Chindi, is the female energy that balances the male energy together, is akin to the, the yin and yang in the uh, Chinese culture. So you have a symbol here of Shiva, who is the destroyer, Chindi, who also represents uh, an, uh, um, destruction, and then we have this symbol being adopted by the Sikhs. You can't see the Kanda here, it's underneath his, uh, his bug, but you have this symbol then being adopted by the Sikhs. So we've said that the warrior tradition existed prior to the Sikhs. And here we have a group of Shivite warriors. It's said that at the time of the, the Mughal conquest, the Hindus could quite easily have got together. Not quite easily, but they, they could have got together and they could have defeated the Mughals. They, they well outnumbered the Mughals. The problem was that there were various sects, and not all of them could unite. The skill of Guru Gobind Singh was that he was able to unite different sects, drawing on commonalities, and, and then make them into Khalsa, and then, and then, so that they could then uphold Dharam. And people like this would have been the types of recruits that he would have been seeking. So you have a group of Shilat warriors here showing the Talwars and Maces and Khandi, etc. Now, I hope everybody's over 18. <laughs> We've clearly uh, caught this guy on a very hot day, or on the way to the beach. But if you can just look past his loin for a second, not literally of course, but let's just try to examine this guy. So Sh Shivite warrior, 19th century. And let's have a look at some similarities here that we can draw. <coughs> so what you've got here is he's carrying chakkar. He's armed here with a shield, a talwar, a matchlock gun. He seems to be wearing kare, for example. He's also got uncut hair, a sign of his detachment from the world and acceptance of the will of God, a sign of a warrior, matted here in the form of a jura. And these are symbols that we then see in the Singh Khalsa. So these guys were then recruiting into the Sikh army and becoming the Khalsa. And here now we can have a look. So both of them are carrying chakras. Here we have the Adjan symbols here. On his the star here. The, weapon, the weapons are very, very similar. You have this guy here who himself is now taking on the form of Lord Shiva. So Lord Shiva, if any of you ever uh, have seen an image of Lord Shiva who represents destruction, um, uh, you'll see he, he's blue, he has uncut hair, he has a crescent in his hair, he is fully armed, he has the river Ganges flowing out the top of his jura. Here we have the Singh with the, the farla flowing out the top of his, uh, the mala, which signifies his rank as an akali or a general. So this here is just, just give us an idea of what was actually going on. Commonalities were being drawn on faith, people's faith wasn't necessarily being destroyed, they were just being, and they weren't necessarily always being true to absolutely new ideas, but their ideas themselves have been re represented back to them uh, in a different format. And then, therefore, 
these guys who come from, some might be worshipping Durga, some might be worshipping Vishnu, some might be worshipping Shiva, were able to unite under this banner and fight and uphold Dharma. Now, if some of, hopefully if some of what I've said and shown you here has been new to you, uh, and it's good and bad, because one way we can look at it is, is why is it new? For the Sikhs who have this great reputation as, uh, as warriors and with our great military past, why, why is some of this information new to us? There's a few different reasons. The main reason being the annexation of the Punjab and the disarming of the Sikhs. Two quite poignant quotes here. After annexation, the Sikhs were disarmed. Uh, and they were disarmed heavily. Robert Cust, who was uh, an English officer at the time, described the disarming of the Sikhs as, def called, he called it defanging the snake. And Punjab, as most of us know here, that is a rural community, a farming community. He goes to the extent to say that even the edge was taken off the tools of the Jats. So not only do the Sikhs lose all their weapons, but in some instances would have lost their livelihoods, I imagine. And the weapons that were taken from the Sikhs, the best weapons were sold off in auctions or sent back to the UK. And most of the utilitarian weapons were melted down for use as war trophies or used uh, uh, for lining the canals in India. Here's some, a detail from a medal from the Anglo-Sikh War showing the surrender of the Sikhs. And I want to read you a quote at this stage. And this is a quote by General Daly in 1849 who witnesses the surrender of the Sikh forces at Rawal Bindi. And he says, At this place I saw the last of the Sikhs in March 1849 lay down their arms. I had seen a mighty Sikh host covering many a mile with their long tapering spears, bright arms and prancing steeds. For when we approached where this force thronged, nobody felt assured that a peaceable end was nigh. I have before told you of that eventful morning when each Sikh approached the rendezvous, laid down his sword, his shield and his matchlock and received a rupee from a British officer standing by, for utter starvation was amongst them. Thus they passed on for hours, till at last the heap of arms, some of great value, jewelled and decorated, was as large as Carisbrook Church. Many an old Sikh did I see with his long white beard, betokening in his soldiery bearing and carriage the pride one in the days of Ranjit, lay his sword on the heap with as much tenderness as a mother would lay her child in its cradle, and then stepping back with tearful eyes, bow his head in reverence and pay a last farewell. It was a sight which those who saw will never forget. So we've seen the rise and fall here of the Sikh, of, of the Sikh, of Sikh power. And we need to consider here the psychological effect of this nation, this Sikh nation who, for them, you know, the, the weapons are in their gudwari. The weapons are discussed in their scriptures. And it is a part of their life. And now they, they are totally, totally stripped of their weapons. And that's why that second point, second quote there earlier on that we saw was so poignant, that now these Sikhs were no longer free. Not only did they lose their weapons, but they lost control of many uh, of their educational institutions in Punjab. Amongst that would have been obviously the, the Shastra Vidya Akari, the Akari that taught the use of these weapons would have been closed down. <coughs> Gradually thereafter we see a decline. You would only really be able to keep Shastra if you were uh, enlisted in the British Army. And here we have... So Shastavid, the, the traditional battlefield arts, would have been watered down slightly and over a generation or two would have uh, been seen in here in the form of the Gatka that we see today, which is more exhibitionist and quite far removed from the traditional battlefield arts of the Khalsa. And we've probably all seen blindfold tricks and roly polies and whatnot. And, and, and this, was, this was how these guys were best keeping their traditions alive at the time. So... You know, performing shows for the people, uh, you know, reminiscing about what once was. And this is a sad truth. It, itself, it had a purpose. Uh, but, but it was no longer the skill that, uh, that it used to be. Now, I'm going to conclude here, and I would have loved to have concluded with a joke or two, um, but I'm going to conclude here, conclude here with, a, with a quote, a quote which I thought was very, very fitting. This quote is uh, from a guy called Gandhi Gyan Singh, who was uh, a descendant of the brother of Bhai Mani Singh, contemporary of Guru Gobind Singh. And Gandhi Gyan Singh, he, um, he was uh, 
very, very good at reciting uh, Gurbani. He was uh, uh, taken to the court of Ranjit Singh, and every morning he would uh, he would be the one who would uh, recite Sukhmani Sahib, part four of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And he says in 1891, he says there was a talk of such a science of archery and stick fighting only a few years ago in the Punjab that hearing about it, the English educated young Sikh men will consider it astonishing. In sincerity, I believe that the young men of today might just consider these skills in Shastravidya generally an impossibility because they have not even seen those bows, never mind having strung them. Similarly, many sciences and skills have declined after attaining their heights. Before 1857, many quivers full of arrows, matchlocks, flintlock guns, swords, lances, spears, sang, gadars, beershkabs, pistols, shields, armour and many types of chainmail were found in every house. All the people in their homes both learnt and taught Shastravidya and became complete soldiers. Now, no one even speaks of these skills, and the sons of brave warriors are becoming engrossed in making money. Even to those of us who have employed Shastravidya, it is becoming as if it were a dream. In another 50 years or so, this vidya will have dried up, and people will say it was all but lies. I'm going to leave you on that thought. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. If you can't think of any now, you can email me later on. Thank you.